Okay, I've titled my talk, The Great Monetary Crossover Has Begun. What will it mean for you? <clears throat> I think the, the, one of the most important books I've read in recent years is The Fourth Turning. You have to realize that life never, things never stay the same. They're always changing. And as one who's lived three quarters of a century, I can tell you that I've seen a lot of changes. The values that, uh, upon which America was created are quite a bit different now than the values in which uh, the general political mainstream thinks right now in America. And it's made a big difference in the way we live our lives, the personal freedom or lack thereof that we have. And it's really changing things very dramatically. And it has its impact on economics and on markets as much as anything else. Because um, I was a young, uh, well, I was in grade school when I was leaving grade school, I was in high school and President Eisenhower uh, was leaving office, and he was very concerned about the military-industrial complex. Eisenhower uh, was well aware, of course, as a general, the amount, the, the enormous amount of interest there was in expanding the military, the amount of money that could be made by the military-industrial complex, and he was very concerned that it could impact the way we live our lives. Our freedom and our liberty, he believed, were very much endangered if the military-industrial complex got out of hand. Well, of course, about that time, Eisenhower was involved as we started getting involved in Vietnam. Uh, and then, of course, uh, with Kennedy, and after that, Lyndon Johnson. And we started, how are we gonna pay for this war was the big question. We were still on the gold standard, and that was a bit of a problem because that didn't allow us to expand and print money like mad. We had to be disciplined. We either had to raise taxes to pay for the war, um, you know, or, or find some way to pay for it uh, other than just print money while we were on the gold standard. Well, heck, we weren't gonna let the gold standard get in the way of our military uh, intervention around the world. So Nixon took us off the gold standard in 71. And you can see there, when Eisenhower gave his speech in 1960, that was the green is the gold hoard that the United States had had at that time, you see what happened in 1971 when Nixon took us off the gold standard, that's where the gold, uh, the gold hoard that America held, it fell dramatically. And so obviously, to save face, we went off the gold standard. The United States could do it because it had the power at that time. And um, so we did. Well, but how did we manage to have the world's reserve currency if there was nothing behind it, if there was no value behind the dollar? Well, we created the petrodollar. Uh, uh, Henry Kissinger met with the Saudis and we guaranteed the Saudis would remain in power, that family uh, would remain in power, uh, if they would make everybody buy their oil in dollars. And this created a bid for the dollar and allowed the dollar to become the world's reserve currency. That gave us an ability to print money like mad. And we have, but that day may be nearing an end. You can see what happened. We we're now close to 30, 32, 30, 30 some trillion anyway right now. And you can see how that's the total US budget uh, deficit, uh, debt I should say. And then on, you can see the other slide there, the federal debt to GDP, 1971. Well, things didn't get real out of hand right away, but they are now. And that big spike you see there is projected by the budget office, the CBO, uh, the Congressional Budget Office. And they are generally pretty, I wouldn't say conservative at all, they're pretty liberal. They basically are pretty optimistic, I should say. And then the other chart shows the massive amount of uh, negative trade balance that we had uh, after, we went off the gold, after we went off the gold standard in 1971. The United States, in order to have the world's reserve currency, had to run massive trade deficits, chronic trade deficits. So how did we do that? We got rid of our value-added jobs, value-added industries, mining, manufacturing, uh, whatever the basic wealth-creating industries we had to get rid of so that we could ensure ourselves, that we could ensure there was enough liquidity sloshing around the world that we could own the world's reserve currency. But we indebted ourselves to the point where I think those days may be coming to an end. I think a really big, big thing was the, how we handled 
the war when Putin and Russia marched into the Ukraine. This is playing out now and it's very, very frightening to me in many ways because I think Eisenhower understood we could not stop, the military industrial complex can't stop doing what it's doing, otherwise it dies. That's how we make, that's how those industries, and it's not just the guys that make the weapons, it's all kinds of other industries that feed into it. So I had David Stockman on my radio show. David Stockman was ahead of the, uh, the budget for Ronald Reagan. He was in the cabinet at that time. I had him on my radio show last March, March, well, March 1st, about a year ago, um, just as President Biden was talking about sanctions. And this is what David had to say if this plays. Let's see. Um, I guess it's not playing. A million people in Washington oh, okay. said, yeah, we, we know how to fix this. Uh, we'll attack the entire global economy and financial system with sanctions and exclusions and, you know, uh, shutting down access to the SWIFT system and all the rest of it. And that'll teach the Russians a lesson. That is crazy as hell. That is going to wreck the trading system of the world, which is actually designed for a peaceful world order. Mm -hmm. It is not designed for a time of warfare. And we're seeing examples of it every day. For instance, we've had this tremendous semiconductor shortage, which we all know is the cause of many of these bottlenecks that we've been having in yep. every kind of industry, including auto. And we find out today that a key ingredient uh, that goes into uh, semiconductor uh, production is actually made. Neon gas is made almost exclusively in the Ukraine, including, in, in fact, the factory is located in the Donbass in the eastern side, and it's shut down. Now, that's one thing. Another, I saw yesterday, there was some desperate guy on Bubble Vision who was, uh, you know, in the international transportation business telling people, that most of the goods which go to Europe from China, and we're talking here hundreds of billions of consumer goods a year, transit through Russia by rail. And all of a sudden, the owners of those goods are not wanting to get caught with their Russian pants down by uh, the sanctions. And so they're desperately attempting to reroute their shipments either by sea or by air. And as a result, almost overnight, prices uh, for ocean uh, freight have increased three to five times on top of the huge eruption that occurred during the COVID era. Yeah. So to make it simple, it's going to cost about 40000 to move goods in uh, one container from China to Europe compared to 2000 pre-COVID 2019 before all of these different disasters descended on the system. Yeah. So somehow if they think they're actually punishing the Russians, you know, they're out of their minds. They're, this is going to, the second, third and fourth order impacts of all these sanctions and disruptions of the very intricate patterns of global trade and finance, they don't have the slightest clue of what's going to happen tomorrow, the next day, and the day after. Uh, and it's going to end up punishing the American people every bit as much. Uh, every bit as much as the Russians. That last uh, part was cut off. What you have to realize is that after, when the Soviet Union broke down, when it, when it, uh, you know, when it was defunct, we had made a promise to Russia, that is NATO did, and the United States, that we wouldn't take on one inch of Eastern European territory into NATO. And what we've done is we've taken on virtually every country in the East, and now we're threatening, threatening, from Putin's point of view, it's a threat, to take the Ukraine into NATO. Putin doesn't want those nuclear weapons on his doorstep. He doesn't want uh, the United States to change his culture, to change his country. So you can agree with him or not, but that's where Putin stands. So what did he do? What did he respond to that? Well, he raised the interest rates to 20% to defend his currency when he went into the Ukraine. And then uh, Russia said to all the Eastern European countries that needed their gas, they said, well, they said the, the countries that are hostile to us can get our gas, but they're going to pay us in either rubles or gold. And this was, I think, the start of, of what I believe is a move towards a gold standard, at least in the, that part of the world. 
Now this shows the inflation. When Trump left office, it was a little over 1%. And I'm not gonna blame all of this on Biden, but certainly all of his measures to reduce uh, hydrocarbon production, uh, to close down the pipeline from Canada, uh, the trillions of dollars that were printed to give away money to people, even as the economy was starting to recover, all of that has played into this inflation. There's the inflation rate during Biden, during Biden's watch, and Trump also created money out of and printed money and gave it to everybody during COVID. So I'm not trying to say that you know one guy is perfect and the other guy isn't, but this is uh, this is the reality of what happened. Will inflation go away? Will this current uh, tough monetary uh, policy of Chairman Powell really work? David Stockman doesn't think so. These are some charts from his service. This, what has happened and allowed inflation to moderate a little bit was the decline in oil prices and some commodity prices, but those are very volatile. And the sticky inflation, which is 70% of the CPI, wages and you know all kind, everything else that's not food and energy, essentially. And there's no sign that that's abating. So we're still at 6% inflation or so. The biggest problem I think that we face is this enormous amount of debt. If the interest rates have to go up, to kill inflation. The problem is that we have 30 trillion, 31, 32 trillion dollars worth of debt now, and those interest rates start to rise. Well, as this slide shows, four and a half percent interest would take 30 percent of the budget, of the, of the budget, 30 percent just to pay interest, which is equal to defense and equal to uh, some of the other major parts of our budget. Well, if, you, if the interest rates have, to, how high do interest rates have to go to clear the market? You know, my first mortgage was 17.5%. Volcker could do that because we didn't have any, our debt to GDP was 35%, now it's 130%, something like that. So it's a different ball game. And it's not as if Russia and China and these countries don't know that we're in trouble. They certainly know that we're in trouble, which is one of the reasons they don't wanna buy our treasuries anymore. They have been backing away from treasuries after 2008 the Chinese and the Russians started saying, this is not looking good, and they started setting up their own system, the, Brit the BRICS, um, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. That's a club, but it's a growing, it's a club with more countries ready and looking to join them. So Sergei uh, Glazov is really the advisor to Putin on monetary issues. Why would, why would, um, why would, countries and let's say oil exporters like Russia or Saudi Arabia, which by the way now is drawn very close to China, why would they not want to get paid in something other than dollars? You know, the whole th idea was that, well, the dollar is a reserve currency. Nobody, nothing can replace it. Uh, actually in Shanghai, they have a futures exchange in oil and a futures exchange in gold. And so Saudi Arabia can, and as I understand, has started to sell their oil for yuan, which they can, if they wish to, exchange immediately in gold. Well, this slide shows the price of oil in grams of gold. The yellow line at the bottom is what oil costs in terms of an ounce of gold. The blue line is the British pound. Um, the, um, the yellow line is the US dollar. The gray line is the euro. So if you're Saudi Arabia and you're wanting to get paid for a, a resource that isn't infinite, you might want something that lasts in value. And the dollar certainly, for sure now, with the inf uh, inflation rates that we're having now, the writing is on the wall. The dollar's days are not endless. Now, Alistair McLeod is someone I have on my radio show, which is now on YouTube as well. It's um, a video. Um, so Alistair really watches this. I don't know if you know Alistair McLeod. He writes for Gold Money. He writes a weekly essay, it's a, a very in-depth, very much in the weeds. Uh, it's, it's very well written and very, I think he understands very well, but he tracks these things and he's su suggesting the Chinese have upwards of 20,000 uh, tons of gold and they've been building it dramatically uh, in the last couple of decades. And the Russians even 12,000 tons estimated according to Alistair's, uh, Alistair's uh, connections. And the United States has what, a little over 8,000 supposedly tons of gold, although the last president to have it really truly audited from an outside independent source was President Eisenhower, who again was concerned about what the military industrial complex might do to our 
way of living and our, um, uh, our, li our lifestyle in America. So the BRICS are really ganging up on the dollar now. And it, it shouldn't be too hard to understand if we can get outside of our own mindset here in the West. If you look at, try to look at it through their eyes, it's a different, it's a different story, the way, they're, the way they're looking at things. We most certainly used the dollar, we weaponized the dollar, took away their trading system, uh, the SWIFT trading system is what Biden did during when they went into Ukraine. Um, they could see the handwriting on the wall, as I just mentioned. They, they had issues. They understood that the United States was living beyond its means. We could live beyond our means for a long time as long as those net export countries were willing to buy our treasuries. And that was China for a while. It was Japan. Japan has its own issues. They're our ally for sure, but they have their own issues, aging population and so forth. So the people that used to allow us to have a free ride, the countries that were net exporters, the ones that we bought more from than we sold to, are no longer buying treasuries. And so you have the BRICS, and they're really starting to flex their muscles now. Keep in mind also that the uh, major part of the world's population is not in the NATO bloc. They're in, the, they're in Asia, they're in, in South America, and south of the equator, there's lots of countries as well. So that are really starting, the countries that can produce goods, uh, commodities, things that we need, uh, rather than just financial assets like the United States has engaged in, uh, increasingly so, in order to finance what we're doing. So this was a very interesting last year, uh, the very cool reception that Mr. Biden received in Saudi Arabia compared to the very warm uh, states like statesman rece uh, reception uh, that, cha that the chairman Xi received when he went to Saudi Arabia. The Saudis have made it known that they will now uh, start selling their, their oil to China for yuan. And by the way, it was just last week or the week before that Iraq said they were doing the same thing. They're selling their oil to China for yuan because they're set up to back the yuan with something real, gold which we did until we decided we couldn't afford the military if we didn't uh, do something different. So really, I think it sort of boils down to, um, as I see this, really, truthfully, America's financial pathology. When you get in debt like we have, when you have so much debt that you can't afford to pay the interest anymore, or you do it great, at great peril, at great price, well, you have, a, you have to either raise taxes or monetize the debt, you really have two choices. You, you, ha you, you have two choices. Um, we have two choices now. One is to do the right thing, which is too late to do now, and that's to tax and, and you know, live within our means, which means that we, we've, we pulled our lifestyle for, we pulled our standard of living forward decades, and now it's gonna have to be paid for. I'm afraid this is true of the whole West, I'm afraid. So, there's really two choices. Either you inflate your way out of this thing, you either defend the currency and do the right thing, or you destroy the currency, you print money, and it becomes endless. And stocks can go up, equities can go up in terms of dollars, but if the dollar buys nothing, what does it mean? This is what happened in hyperinflation Germany. I pray to God this doesn't happen here, but it, it, I don't see, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, you can tell me what you think. I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm afraid. So I think if, you, if you're a student of history at all and you've looked at John Law's Mississippi bubble, that might be instructive. Or if you just look at the policies our, our country has taken, um, Paul Volcker could do the tough thing. As I said, my first mortgage was a 17.5% mortgage. He could, do the right, he could do the right thing then because our debt to GDP was 35%. Uh, percent. Now it's 130 percent. It's a different. It's a different story. So as much as Chairman Powell, I think, would like to do the to to get this thing under control, they're hoping that inflation will come down now with this recession. I hope they're right, but I fear they're not for reasons because I think we've unleashed enormous amounts of money that used to go into the stock market, and now it's not going to the stock market. It's it, these equity markets have become so overpriced. So if we look at the FANG stocks, well, Facebook, now Meta, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, uh, what we're looking there, uh, the red line is uh, free cash flow. The blue line is the uh, aggregate market cap of those companies. 
So we've seen an 80% decline from the peak in free cash flow over the last five years. And we've seen the stocks go down by 35%. I don't know, this is probably a month old, this slide. So it may have changed a bit, but that's the idea. So I think what we saw was pretty much no place to run, no place to hide during the last couple of years. Normally you could go to the treasury market, but you can't go to the treasury market now with interest rates rising, with inflation going crazy. And so where do you go? I, I think you, you go to gold, that's what the BRICs are doing. That's what the countries are doing that try to um, restore their, or to hold on and to build a life for their citizens. You know, um, the, the, uh, the BRICs, China, um, China and India and those countries, highly populous countries are not going to give up their middle class lifestyle uh, just because we want, just, just because we're worried about, uh, you know, about, about the climate. Uh, they're not doing it, obviously. So that's an issue. So we're, there may be one place to go. The Bangs, Barrick, Agneagle, Eagle, Newmont, these three. And that slide is, isn't quite properly stated. I said the rise in market cap is far less than free cash flow. Actually, what you see there, the red line is free cash flow. And the blue line is aggregate market cap. It's actually tracked pretty, pretty well. So what I'm saying is I think the gold stocks are priced fairly, whereas the, uh, whereas the other stocks, uh, the fangs are not. And then the other thing I would just leave you with is the Dow to gold ratio compared to the consumer price index. The consumer price index is the red line. The blue line is the uh, Dow to gold ratio. And you can see that in the past, inflation has gone up quite a bit sooner than, than the Dow to gold ratio has gone up. So we're seeing now inflation going up, the Dow to gold ratio, gold hasn't gone up much, uh, gold to Dow ratio hasn't gone up much, but I, I think that is likely to come. Just a little advertisement for turning hard times into good times, that's my radio show, which is now uh, a video presentation at YouTube uh, every day, every Wednesday at three o'clock p.m. Eastern time. And uh, a lot of very interesting guests on there that you might wanna check out sometimes. So with that, that's it for me.